worship night. It's going to be amazing. Uh, we've been in a series. Yeah, somebody's excited. I'm excited for it. Uh, we haven't done a worship night in a long time, and so really, really looking forward to it. And just know that if you're on the fence about coming, this came from, from God. I mean, God burdened my heart uh, for this specific night. And then the other announcement that I have for you is that today there's a youth gathering at 3.30. So this is for high school kids. So if, you're, uh, if you have a child in high school, a kid in high school, come tonight at 3.30. And uh, Pastor Kyle, who does our, our youth, our high school ministry, he's going to be here. And he just put together a really fun afternoon for them. And so then they're here at 3.30. Worship night starts at 5 o'clock. It's just a, a really incredible opportunity there. And we want to get the, the youth uh, really involved in worship. And that's, that's why Kyle's gone to great lengths to provide a space for them. Uh, so looking forward to it. All right, are we ready to get into today's message? We've got some great praise and worship at the end of this. And so I, I just want to kind of uh, really simplify what I had for you guys today so that we can get there. And the series that we're in, especially if you're new, maybe we've got some new people here that are here for the baby dedication, is been in a series called Your Rescue Story. And what a rescue story is, is a rescue story is a story about the moment where Jesus rescued you from your sin. That, that's a rescue story. It's not a story about uh, making it to the petrol station even though the, the, the empty light was on. Now this is a story specifically about when Christ rescued you from your sin. This requires that you would understand that you lived in sin, you were born in sin, you needed the Savior, and the Savior was invited into your life, your sins were forgiven. That, that's what this is. It's the gospel message. And so th this whole kind of month really has just been a progression of the gospel message. And it started with being rescued, that we are rescued by Jesus. Not a single one of us has a, a part in our life that Jesus will enter into it and pull you out of your sin, pull you out of your situation and rescue you. And then what happens is that there, there's three kind of R's here with this. Rescue, redeemed, and restored. And when we're rescued, we're immediately redeemed. What that means is the second that I ask Jesus into my life and ask for forgiveness of my sins, I am redeemed. So I don't have to pay the price that my sin cost because Jesus paid it for me. So I am redeemed. But the third part to this, which is to be uh, uh, restored, which really focuses around healing, that doesn't come immediately or automatically. That's a process that we walk through. And last week we walked through the process of emotional healing. And last week as we went through that, I had close to 70 people across two services stand and declare that they wanted emotional healing from a broken heart or from a, a bruised spirit. And 70 people said, hey, I, I've got a memory that I want healing from. And they were restored. They were healed from that. And so today as we look at rejoicing, rejoicing just kind of feels like it's a, a, a natural sort of ebb and flow out of what's been going on. If you're one of those people that got a rescue story during this series, you, you know, okay, God did this really good thing in my life. And so now I rejoice. Now I say thank you for doing that. God, I praise you for that. That's why we're having a worship night tonight. That's why I've got a great worship set after my message today. It's an opportunity to rejoice. But there's more to rejoicing than just saying, great, a good thing happened in my life, and now I'm thankful for that good thing. Instead, re rejoicing is a lot deeper than that. In fact, Rejoicing is actually, it's a superpower. And here's why it's a superpower. Because rejoicing as a superpower can be used to overcome. So this is a tool that we have to overcome trials, to overcome hardship, to overcome uh, adversity, to overcome sorrow. We're going to talk about sorrow a little bit. Rejoicing is our tool in order to overcome. But just in the same way that so it applies to the same rules that superpowers uh, apply to. So there's kind of two things for us to know about superpower. Because rejoicing, it's a superpower. But not everyone has, has superpowers. Not everyone has them. 
And then also not everyone would even know how to use them if they had them. Or even those of us that have it, we don't always know how to use it. And, and that's kind of the tricky thing about superpowers, is that not everyone's got every superpower, and not everyone knows how to use it. And rejoicing as a superpower, a lot of us definitely don't know how to use it. We don't know the potential in it. We don't know what it means to be able to pull that superpower out and be able to use it and apply it to overcome situations in our life. We know it's a concept. We know that some people do that. Some people are just naturally uh, you know, thankful and happy, and they praise God for things, or they're able to see the, the bright side of life. But most of the rest of us, we don't even like those people. I think those people are, are, are you know, it's like, who are you, you know? In, in my real world, you know, it's hard to do that. It's hard to be that way. But what I would say about, about this, you know, in general, especially if you read the comics, if we're talking about the Marvel Universe and stuff, not everyone's got every single power. But every single one of us does have this superpower, which is what makes it special. It's what makes it different. It's, it, it's what makes it, it kind of like sets it apart, is that we actually, we all do have this one specific superpower, The second statement remains true, is that we don't all know how to use it. So what I want to do today is I want to help us to become superheroes with our superpowers. I want us to be able to do that. I want you to be able to um, put your your cape on. You know, Lifa, our son, I can talk about him because he's away on a hiking trip with Rhonda Bosch right now. They're out on on a journey and uh, they do 10 days of hiking um, around, and it's, it's a really cool experience for them. But growing up, uh, when he was little, when I married Casey, Leafa was seven. And uh, he used to run around with a, a cape on, and he wore that cape for a long, long time. He's 15 now, about to turn 16. He wore that cape all the way up to 13 years old. So when you got, no, he didn't. But when you see him, you can say, no, don't, because he'll never come to church again. Leave him alone. But he had a cape that he would wear and he would run around. And I want to help you. I want to help us figure out how to put our cape on. I also want to make you aware of things that that will take the cape off of you. Things that will prevent you from opening up the superpower and putting that superpower on. But before I do that, I've got to confess something to you. And the thing that you need to know about me and about this week is that, you know, Sometimes being your pastor is not easy, and that's because a lot of you are difficult. No, okay. You're not, but I just want to see if you're awake. You know, it's, it, it can be hard. Sunday comes every week, and I, 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 I try, my wife and I, we try and keep ourselves and our family in a healthy position, but it's really hard to preach a sermon on something that maybe I'm struggling to apply in my own life. And this week, knowing that I'm preaching on rejoicing all week from last Sunday all the way through the week, I struggled with having the ability to rejoice. You know, I kind of felt like my spirit was underneath the heel of a boot and that I just couldn't get out from under it. I just could not pull myself up. I couldn't find the happiness or the joy. I really struggled to just rejoice. I wasn't, I didn't doubt God. I didn't doubt salvation. I I wasn't struggling with the foundations of my soul, the foundation of my life. But I just had a really hard time being thankful, having gratitude, rejoicing, praising God. I just struggled to do that. And as I was working on this message, I just thought like, God, this is, okay, one of two things. If this has got anything to do with Satan, because last week we had this amazing thing happen here in the church, and Satan's like, I don't want this to happen again, so Chris is going to speak on rejoicing. So let me just put the heel of my boot on Chris and keep him from doing that. I was like, God, it's like Sunday's close. I need you to deal with this so that I can write a sermon on this thing here. And then I was like, God, but if it's you, then point me. Show me. You, you better you better show me something or else this is going to be a really awkward 35 minutes here. And God was faithful 
And he did. He showed me something that I otherwise would not have seen, I would not have found. And you know, I'm not, I'm not under the heel of the boot because I can use my superpower of rejoicing. And God showed me in Psalm 42 and Psalm 43, which is what we're going to look at today. He showed me, uh, actually, because of time, we're only going to look at Psalm 42. But on your own, if you read Psalm 43, it's, it's very similar. It's kind of a repeat of Psalm 42. And he, he showed me this. And in this, the psalmist is, is writing from a perspective that I could identify with. And so I don't know if this message is going to help you. I know it helped me. And I know that as I unpack the scripture, as I read through it, and by unpacking the scripture, it, it's, I don't want you to imagine me as a pastor with Bibles all around me and candles lit and worship music playing. No, it's me sitting in a dirty t-shirt with probably like kid juice or something, you know, from one of the kids all over it. And just with my head in my hands trying to figure this thing out. That's what it means to unpack something, to wrestle through it. And as I wrestled through this, this thing that God put on my heart, I, I found this guy that the psalmist was talking about. I found him, and I could see my life in his life. And, and I could gain inspiration from him, and he taught me some things. He taught me how to pull my cape out, how to put my cape on. And so I, we're, we're going to read Psalm 42. It's not a super complicated sermon this morning. Well, they never are, because I'm not a, that smart of a person. But the, my, my hope is that you pick up something from this that teaches you how to put your cape on, that teaches you how to find yourself in a place where it's hard to rejoice, where it's hard to be thankful, and do it anyway. And it equips you to be able to rein your own heart and feelings and emotions in and take control of those and hold them accountable and do it anyway. Rejoice anyway, despite how you feel. So let's look at this guy. Let's look at the guy that the psalmist is writing about. Let's find ourselves in it. So in Psalm 42, it's where we start here. And in verse 1, Kind of like most stories, or, or like, the, well, a lot of psalms, but even just most stories, it starts out really lighthearted. It starts out really good. Well, maybe not lighthearted. It's actually quite passionate. It, it's, it's really, it, it just starts out connecting, you know, this guy and his love for God and his need for God. And this is, I could identify with this. I love God, and I know that God loves me, and I know that I need God, even before I gave my life to Christ, I knew I needed God, needed God in my life. And so look at how he explains our need for God. He says, as the deer pants longingly for the water brooks, so my soul pants longingly for you, oh my God. My soul, my life, my inner self, it thirsts for God, for the living God. See, he, he chooses words really specifically here. He's talking about a deer panting for water. That deer may have been evading a predator. It may have been running. It may have been sprinting. It may be out in the sun, you know, being beat down by the heat all day long. But, but it, it pants. It longs for water. And when it gets that clean, uh, cool water source, it's refreshing. It's life restoring. Same with, with the psalmist. He's saying in that same way, I long for God. See, it doesn't say that he he eats or he's hungry for God. It says he thirsts. Because see, we can deal and live without food for a long time. Don't use me as a personal example for that, but you can, I promise, you can. You can skip lunch today. Thanks for laughing, Tim. You can skip lunch today and you will be okay. You can even skip dinner and you'll be okay. You can go a long time without food, but it's really hard to go a long time without water. In fact, you can't do it. Water is the most essential thing that we need in our life for survival. Uh, you know, other than love and kindness and touch and affection and those things. But water is one of the most important elements that we need for survival. And this is why he's saying, my soul thirsts. I need the living water. I need the water of Christ. If I don't have water, I don't have anything. If I don't have Christ then I have absolutely nothing. So we're starting the psalm out with a declaration 
of dependency on God. And so as I read this, and maybe you now, I said, okay, hey, I'm there. God, I am declaring my dependency and my need on, for, for you and of you, especially this week when it's so hard to rejoice. I walked around this week feeling like I got hit by a bus. And if it's God doing something in me to benefit you, then I'm frustrated with all of you. Okay, I went through a lot this week for you. You better enjoy this. You better learn from this, okay? I'm not doing this again. And so it's, it's, it's I had a dependency for God this week. I got the uh, opportunity and the ability to need God more. And so that, that's what this psalmist starts with. Then he goes on, continues, and he says, okay, now we have a shift. God, I'm dependent on you. It's a beautiful scene of a deer drinking from a brook. And he says, when will I come and see the face of God? And what that actually is, is he's quite literally far away from the temple in Jerusalem. See, in, in his day in the Old Testament, long time ago, the temple, see, God was everywhere. They, they did know that, believe that. But the temple was the central worship place, the place of worship. And he was used to going to the temple Worshiping God, worshiping God with his community. Essentially, what this guy is saying is, I miss my community. How long am I going to be away from my home church, away from my community? How long is this going to last here? And then he goes on to say, my tears, my tears have been my food day and night. You know, gives me the image of just the tears falling down his face. You know, when you cry, when you ugly cry, you've got snot and tears. It's all over the place. It's salty. And it, that, that's what I think. It's not a gentle rolling down his eye. This guy's been sobbing. He's been ugly crying because while they say to me all day long, where is your God? What, what he's saying here is that he's being persecuted. He lives in a city far from Jerusalem. And these people aren't questioning the existence of God. That actually comes way later in, uh, in history. You know, th- th- these people, they understood that, okay, yeah, you've got a God. We understand that it is, you know, God, but where is he at? Which means that they're watching him cry. They're watching him ugly cry. They're watching him walk around with his head hung low. They're watching him live, you know, exist in sorrow. They're watching him struggle. They can see it. I could identify with this. All week this week, I had people saying, are you okay? You know, you look like death. You know, uh, Trudy, our family ministry director, was like, you know, wow, Chris, you look really horrible today. On Tuesday, I thought, that's great, you know. That's fantastic. Because it, it, when you live in sorrow, when you have a struggle with rejoicing, I mean, it, it even like changes your face. And they can see that in this guy. And because of that, they're like, hey, where, where, like, come on, man, where's your God? Like, that, that's what you do. You pray to your God. Sacrifice to your God. If you don't want to use your God, you can use one of our gods. May I introduce you to three or four options here? One of them may be a better fit for you. And so they're saying, where, where is this God of yours? And then what our psalmist does, you know, in, in this sorrow that he's carrying. Actually, before I tell you what he does, I want to read you a quote on sorrow. Because sorrow... Uh, is, is probably one of the stronger emotions, but it's an emotion that God gave me this week, sorrow. I told Casey one night, I just feel sorrow in my heart. And then God kind of exposed this quote as I was studying the, 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 the scripture here on sorrow. So let me read this for you. I just thought this was great. Sorrow is always a sense of lack. The sorrow of bereavement, is the sense of the loss of a loved one. The sorrow of sickness is the lack of health. The ultimate sorrow is the sense of the lack of God. This was the supreme sorrow of the psalmist. He had the sense of a lack of God. That's why he says, when will I come and see the face of my God? This guy had a broken heart filled with, with sorrow. Sorrow is a heavy thing to carry. And so he declares that, like, God, I'm, where are you? 
And it's affecting him in a way that even everyone is saying, what's wrong with you? Why don't you call out to your God? And so this guy goes on, and in verse 4, he shows us you know, what he does. And this is actually a dangerous thing for us. We can really get caught up in this here. So he starts to think about the past, starts to remember the good times of the past, the good old days that once were. And he says, back in the good old days, these things I vividly remember as I pour out my soul. So as he's ugly crying, as people are looking at him saying, what's wrong with you, buddy? As he's confessing that he needs God and he longs for God, as he's kind of ugly crying about all the sorrow that he feels, he's saying, I, I, I remember these amazing things that happened in my past. How I used to go along before the great crowd of people and lead them in procession to the house of God. He's saying how I used to worship with my fellow community, with my church. How I used to walk into the temple and it feel like home and I could lead people in worship. You know, that, that just was such a good memory for me. And he's just, he's, he's thinking about that. And again, I could identify with that. In a week of sorrow, in a week of struggling to praise God, to worship God, and, and feeling and saying, God, where are you? I could think back and, and think to all the good times that I've had, all, all the high points that I've had with God. And, and, I, and then even like thinking about them in detail and, and even describing them in detail with God. And that's what he's doing. He describes back in detail the good times that he had in the past and what he longs for to God. And this is the, the detail of what he means here. It goes on to say, in, uh, in the, on the next slide here, it says, like a choir master before his singers. So he's praise. That's why praise is so important. So we're talking about rejoicing. So he's talking about the rejoicing that he did before, timing the steps to the music and the chant of the song with the voice of joy and thanksgiving, a great crowd keeping a festival. And he's describing in detail what he misses, and what he no longer has. This is a trap for us because instead of working on today or working on today for tomorrow, we get stuck in our past. And we get stuck in the, well, why can't it be like it used to be? We get stuck in the used to be's. This used to be a lot easier. God used to show up here. I used to get the warm and fuzzies when I did this, when I read my Bible or I came to church. I, I used to trust God, but then something happened and it broke my trust. I used to understand you, God, but now I no longer understand you. What are the used to be's in your life? I, I want to caution you. Because spending too much time in the past, spending too much time reminiscing on the good things in the past and comparing those to the bad things that you're dealing with now is a dangerous, dangerous thing. Because it's not going to lead you to a great place. And I'm not saying don't celebrate the good memories that you have. That's a very different thing. I finally and often just find encouragement by thinking back on the things that God has done in my past. But that's different from what He's doing. What he's doing is he's longing for this thing that he had in the past, and it's a dangerous place because it'll keep you from moving forward. It'll keep you stuck. And all it does is it highlights how bad the situation that you're currently in feels like. So we got to put an end to that. And that part of that is we got to put our cape on. we got to access that superpower of rejoicing because that's how we're going to get through this. That's how we're going to break through. But that, it's hard to do. It really is. And so watch how he does this. Watch what he does with his own soul, with his own heart. The first thing that he does after reminiscing is he recognizes how dangerous this is. So he, he pauses. It's a long pause. I like to imagine that this was a real soul-searching revelation here. And that he, he tries to just stop himself. You know, I, I don't know if you've ever been on a diet or you've ever tried to quit like an addiction and you, you've gone clean, you've gone sober for a long time and that temptation comes and you want to you wanna give in, you want to grab the drink, you want to eat the food, you want to look at what's on the computer and sometimes you're strong enough and you, you pause and before you grab that drink or do that thing, whatever it is, and you, you, you have a moment of pause and you think to yourself, wait a minute. Is this really what I want? Is this good? 
Is this the right thing for me here? And sometimes we're strong enough and sometimes we're not, but this, this guy has this moment. Is this leading me to a place that I want to go? Do I want to sit in my sorrow? Do I want to continue in that? And he pauses. And then he does something that's just incredibly bold. And it's something that we can do. What he does here is he puts his cape on to grab that superpower. But look at how he does it. In verse 5, he says that, that this phrase that's in the Bible that I've come to so many times and gained so much encouragement from in the past. And it says, why are you in despair, O my soul? And why have you become restless and disturbed within me? Hope in God and wait expectantly for him, for I shall again praise. There's that praise, that rejoice. He says, I shall again rejoice in him for the help of his presence. Help here translates into salvation. For the salvation being saved, being rescued by my Redeemer. You know, and every time that I've read this verse up until this point, I've had this this feeling in my heart, in my soul of kind of saying like, Oh, my soul, where are you, God? This very uh, ephemeral sort of searching. Where are you, God? Oh, my soul, kind of almost crying out. Where are you? You know, this, this aching in your soul of saying, where are you? But you know what? That's not what's happening here. That's not the attitude that our psalmist is taking. And I'm I'm so thankful for it. Because when I learned what was really happening in him, it gave me some encouragement. It gave me some strength. And I applied this then to my life. Instead, what this psalmist is saying, after he reminisces, and after he spends time thinking about the past, and he realizes how close he's coming up to a very dangerous place in his life, he takes that long pause, and then he says, Oh, my soul, hey, what is happening here, soul? No, 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 we can't go down this road. We can't go down this pathway. Oh, my soul, what are you doing? Oh, my soul, hey, inner self, inner soul, why have you become restless and disturbed within me? What he's doing is he's calling his own soul into accountability. He's saying, what is going on with you? Because we should be thankful. We should be praising. We should be rejoicing. We know that we we have the love of God. We know God's in our life. I know I have a relationship with God. So why am I wasting my time, soul, being full of sorrow and being distressed? Our psalmist is speaking with authority to his soul. He's saying, what are you doing? It's not a, oh, God, where are you? Oh, my soul. No, it's a, hey, soul, by the authority of God, by the authority of of what I know comes with the superpower of rejoicing, what on earth are you up to? Because it's not going to stand here. And then he gives his soul instruction. And that instruction is not a, a lofty hope in God. That instruction is a declarative. This is what you're going to do. You are going to hope in God and wait expectantly for Him. You're not going to hope in God and wonder. You're going to hope in God and expectantly wait. God, I know you're going to bail me out of this. God, I know you're going to restore my soul. God, I know you're going to restore rejoicing in me. God, I know that I'm an overcomer. I know that there's nothing that you don't have authority over. So God, I will wait as long as I need to wait because I'm claiming authority in my soul and I will not be consumed with sorrow. I will hope and wait for God. That's what he's doing. He's claiming that in his life, that truth. So it's very different from, oh, my soul, where are you? Instead, he's putting his foot down with authority and he's saying, you are going to hope and wait on God because God is still God. And then he he goes on to say, for I shall praise him again. So he says, I am not only going to hope and wait on God, I'm going to praise. And that's what's going to happen after this message. That's what's going to happen tonight. If you find yourself in a place of sorrow, if you can't find a way to rejoice, if you can't find something to rejoice over, then you know what? Tell your soul to just stuff it and get your body here and see what happens when you just 
praise God anyway. See, what this is, is that's taking sorrow, which we have this image of, of our, our superpower, of rejoicing, being put in a locked box, and then being welded shut, and then that box being put in a safe, and that box being put in another safe, and then somebody sinking that in a shipping container to the bottom of the ocean. And sit, sitting in that is our superpower of rejoicing. And we think, how can I ever retrieve that? Because my sorrow has buried it so far away from me. But it's not there. It's not that far away. It's just one whisper away. That's the name of Jesus, Jesus. And that's the next thing that he does here. Because not only does he proclaim it over his life, but then he takes it to Jesus. He doesn't go to Jesus and say, I'm sorted, I'm fixed. He goes to Jesus and he confesses everything that he feels. And he, he, he says in, in the next verse, in verse 6, he says, oh my God. He's talking to God now. I just declared authority over my soul. But oh my God, my soul is in despair within me. The burden more than I can bear. So first you deal with yourself. But yourself doesn't have to be fixed or solved. You just deal with yourself and then you confess it to God. Nothing's changed in this guy's life other than the fact that he's declared something over his heart. And then he's taken what he was and what he is and taken it to God. And he says that, therefore, I will fervently remember you from the land of the Jordan and the peaks of the Mount Hermon to the Mount Mizar. He, he's, he's saying, God, you are the authority over all the land. You're the authority over everything that I know. I will, I will relentlessly remember you. Because, God, I'm confessing to you that I'm in despair. I'm struggling. My soul is struggling. And then he, he, he goes on to personify what, he, what he's feeling. See, God wants to know how you feel. He really does. He wants to know how you feel, what you're struggling with, where you're at, what you're going through. So you, you, can, you can personify, you can tell God. You don't have to go to God fixed. And I, I did this this week. I do this a lot. And I'm sure I'll do it again in the future. You don't need to come up to me after the service. Are you okay? Are you, you know, I'm not in self-destruct mode. Everything is fine. But you know what? Sometimes we just have a hard week. Sometimes it's just hard to rejoice. And so just like this guy's about to do, I did. I just, you know, I love pulling out a pen and a piece of paper and just journaling, putting my feelings, my thoughts, putting everything out there to God. And watch his journal here in verse 7. He says, deep calls to deep at the thundering sound of your waterfalls. He's talking about the depths of his hurt, the depths of his pain. It's like deep calling to deep. It's not, I'm in the deep end and I'm calling up to rescue on the surface. No, he's just in the void of the deep. And everything that he's calling for kind of feels like it's all just deep calling to deep. There's no sunlight. There's no rescue that he can see. It's the way he feels. And he confesses that to God. He's journaling this, basically. And then he, he, he says, you know, I, I, I'm underneath all your breakers and all your waves. They've all rolled over me. If you've ever been hit by a big wave, it's not fun, and it hurts, and it pummels you, and it bounces you around. And, and this is just pouring over him, rolling over him. He's in a hard place right now. So he's saying, I'm, I'm not fixed. This is still really a struggle for me. Because this stuff is just pounding me over and over and over again. But then in verse 8, see, he pulls himself out of that again. See, this is a pattern that we see here. Is that life gets hard and we feel like we're being beat up. We feel like our superpower of rejoicing is put in a box and thrown at the bottom of the ocean. But if we learn to just confess that to God and then declare a truth over our lives then we, we can go down that road a million times. This guy goes back and forth three or four times over this psalm and over the next psalm. And he says, after saying that deep calls to deep and I'm being pummeled by the waves, he says, yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime. I'm covered in the daytime because God is with me. And yet despite how I feel, even in the night, his song will be with me. I will not be alone. He, as soon as his soul starts to slip back into sorrow, into despair, 
He brings it back to God. Just keeps bringing it back to God. And then now he says a prayer next. He, he, he's, okay, let me now pray to you, God. And in the next part of the scripture here, he, he says a prayer to God of my life. So here's the prayer. I will say to God my rock. God is his rock. That means he has a relationship with God. Him and God are in a tight relationship together. He's gone to God before. He's taken his life, his problems to God before. And God, he sees God as his rock, his stronghold, the good thing in his life. And he says, God, you are my rock. Why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? See, I, I don't think that this is him questioning the existence of God. I think it's a lot like the way I felt this week. God, why? What are you doing here in my life? Am I missing something? A am I missing something that you're trying to show me? Or are you dangling my superpower, the cloak? Or the cape of rejoicing. Just, here it is, Chris, just put it on. You're okay, man. Just put this on. Dangling that in front of me. But I'm saying, where are you, God? You're right here. God, why are you letting this happen to me? Why are you letting me mourn? God said, well, it's right here. Just rejoice in me. Just rejoice. But that's hard. And he shows here, this is the first time that we see in this chapter that it takes more than just one verse or one sentence for him to pull himself back to God, for him to pull himself out of that sorrow. And in verse 10, he says, As a crushing of my bones with a sword, my adversaries taunt me while they say continually to me, Where is your God? And so for the first time we see now we're a couple verses in and he's not pulled it back around. Well, that just shows me that in the same way that I'm human, he's human, that you're human, that life comes and we continue to take that, we continue to try and deal with it. And if you don't have Jesus in your life, I don't know how you do life. Because with Jesus, I've got this amazing Savior that I can give things to. He can take those off my plate. Even when I don't feel like he's around, I don't always feel like he's paying attention to me. You don't, don't understand why he's letting me go through the things that I'm going through. I, he's still there. And the truth is, I know he has never left me. But if, you're, if you don't have that, then you really are just, you're out in the void on your own. Now, I really want to invite you in to not be out there on your own. Come, come in here. It's better. I promise. It is. And so he calling out to God, you know, he's telling God what he feels, telling God how hard it is, because this is now like the third time that he's had to realign his soul. He's probably just getting tired. It's getting harder and harder. And just as it gets harder and just as it, he, he's struggling to pull himself back under, you know, rejoicing and praising God and into God's truth, just maybe as we see that he's not going to be able to do it because the pattern has been broken. In verse 11, the last verse of the chapter here, and this is the last one I'm going to read you, he says again, Hey, soul, I am going to continue to bring you into alignment with my God. I'm going to continue to bring you into alignment with the truth that comes from my God. And with that same attitude of, Oh, my soul, I am claiming authority over you and holding you accountable. He says, why are you in despair, O oh my soul? You should not be in despair. You should be thankful. We should be praising God. Why are you in despair? Stop it. Pull yourself out of this. Soul, you are not, I'm not going to let you stay in despair. Why have you become restless and disquieted within me? Now here's what you're going to do. You're going to hope in God. You're going to wait expectantly for Him. For I shall yet praise God him. He goes back to the superpower. Right here, he puts the cape on and he says, I'm going to praise and rejoice in him. He says, the help of my countenance and my God. Help here, like I said, it's tra translated into salvation. The salvation of my countenance. Remember previously, he was crying, he was ugly crying and everyone around him was saying, what's wrong with you? They could see visually that there was something going on in his life. But now with the salvation of God, his countenance changes. 
His face becomes bright. His face becomes full of life. His face becomes full of hope because he's commanded hope into his soul. So what this whole psalm is, and what I kind of found from this, is this is just going to be a journey of life. There is no end. There is no completion. There is no, hey, I'm fine and never going to deal with this again. What this is, is it's the relentless rejoicing. It's just relentless. We just do it over and over and over and over again. And sometimes we lose strength and we can't do it on our own, so we come in here. Maybe that's why the psalmist missed his home community so much. It's because he didn't have to do life alone there. Now he finds himself maybe a little bit alone. He's missing that because he doesn't have a place where he can go, where people can uphold him and uplift him and pour into him like we have here. And how thankful I am that we have this church and this community and all of you guys out here. I mean, you guys help and do so much for me and, and my wife and my family, I know. And so it's just the relentless rejoicing, the relentless pursuit of God, of taking my heart to God. And so here's what you're going to do as we, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to go into worship. And then if you come tonight, if you come to our worship tonight from 5 to 7, then this is what we're going to do. We're just going to simply rejoice. When the voices in your head tell you or the voices in your heart tell you, ah, you're not worth this, this isn't going to work, God's not real, like you can rejoice all you want, but when you get out of here, you're still going to have the same problems. When all that's happening, all the chatter, you don't, have, don't try and solve any of that. Just show up. And when the music comes on, just open up. Show up and open up. And just rejoice in God. Watch what happens in your life. Watch what happens. I can promise you, I'm not super holy or super spiritual. But I put this to the test every single day. And sometimes for extended seasons, if you know my story, you know I've struggled in the past with major, major depression, major depressive breakdowns. And you know what? Even in those moments, it is the rejoicing of God and therapy. If you need therapy, get therapy and medication. If you need medication, get medication. Do the things that you need to do. But that in combination with God, with rejoicing, is, that, that always has always pulled me through and will always continue to pull me through. And it will pull you through. Don't try and fix your life. Just rejoice. Don't try and understand it. Just rejoice. Don't spend all the time thinking about the past. Just rejoice. If you don't feel like you can command your spirit and your heart to be held accountable for how it feels, that's okay. Just rejoice. Just show up. Show up and open up. It's all you have to do. This is probably the easiest uh, call that I could give you guys. Just show up, stand up, and just let God work in your life. Everybody gets a cape this morning. No matter where you are, no matter where you've come from, there is a cape in front of every single one of you. Just reach out and put it on, and then just rejoice. So let's bow our heads and close our eyes. The band's going to get ready and then lead us in that worship. Heavenly Father, we just thank you.